Here. Well, yep. okay. Uh, good morning. It's Friday, April 8th, 2022, and this is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We're resuming work uh, right now on Bill H715, an act relating to the clean heat standard. And we have Ms. Manchester in from the Joint Fiscal Office to share a fiscal note with us and go through it. Thanks very much for coming in and thanks for bringing a note so we'll all understand the, the fiscal impacts of 715. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office. I will be talking to you today about the fiscal note for H715, an act relating to the clean heat standard that is available on the website. Um, and I believe the committee has it as well, but I will share my screen. I, I want to note at the outset that the fiscal note is rather perfunctory. <laughs> We're looking at the um, the actual appropriations for the coming fiscal year, which are not pertaining to the overall economic and fiscal impact of the bill going forward. Um, we'll see at the end that we simply don't have the information to do that more wide ranging analysis at this point. So we'll be sticking to the, um, the appropriations, but uh, I'm going to share my screen now and we can go through that fiscal note uh, why am I not seeing my fiscal note? Hmm. Oh, I see. Are you doing it from the website, Joyce? I'm sorry? Are you doing it from the website? Yeah, I've got it now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Full screen. Here we go. You should see it now, yes? Yep. Um, can you zoom in a step or so? How's that? Great, thank you. Good. All right, so I should note that this is joint work with Julia Richter in my office. Um, so let's get right into it. So the overall fiscal impact is 1.2 million on the general fund for fiscal year 2023. And there are two appropriations that add up to the 1.2 million. First, the Public Utility Commission would receive 600,000. And as we'll see in a more detailed table in just a second, the PUC would get payment for three new FTEs, three consultants, per diems for public members of two advisory groups and marketing and public outreach. So they have a lot to do with their 600,000. The Department of Public Service also receives 600,000. They also would pay for three new FTEs and costs associated with verification and evaluation of the clean heat credits. So I've shown you in the fiscal, whoops, shown you in the fiscal note that section two establishes the clean heat standard. I believe the committee's been through all of this. Um, one of the critical elements of the clean heat standard legislation is to look at life cycle carbon emission yeah. reductions. They're out at the front door. Um, and if you need a mask, we, you're out of the front door. Oh. oh, we can only have, pardon well, me. We're not at 10. We're not at seats. Are we at okay. so. What committee? H1. This is a, uh, just about fuel. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the right yeah. one. But we don't have chairs. Thank you. Right. So we, no. we have a, uh, sorry, a limit based on how many people come in. So I hate to say this, but only one of the two of you can come. We can have three more people sitting in chairs. But... I'm happy to leave. Uh, uh, sorry, it's just. Say? Yeah, we just we'll need. Right. Yeah. 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 People are coming. The, the committee will be coming. Uh, oh, these are doing the lunchroom. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Thank you. Could you cover your nose, sir? I'm sorry, but could you cover your nose? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's a little awkward, but no, it's uh, the way it goes. The yeah. way it is, yeah. we, we've never lived through a pandemic before, so we're all adjusting every day. Um, with that, uh, back to you, Ms. Manchester. Thank you. So I was just reviewing section two. 
that sets up some of the requirements on the PUC. Um, it involves looking at life cycle CO2 emission reductions. It involves uh, setting up a system of tradable heat credits um, that depend on a rule of order that has to be set up by the PUC. And uh, the PUC is also responsible for hiring a consultant to develop the various clean heat measures and assumptions using those life cycle emissions analysis. So, and then we come to the Department of Public Service, which is responsible for verification and evaluation. Then we have two advisory groups. One is the technical advisory group uh, that is established in section two. Uh, and those members would be eligible to get per diems and expenses if they are not state employees. And then we have the Clean Heat Standard Equity Advisory Group that also assists the commission. And again, they would be eligible for per diems and expenses if they're not otherwise compensated. Section three spells out how the Clean Heat Standard will be implemented. And there, there's a, another consultant, a facilitator to help with the public engagement process, advertising the public meetings, hiring a, a consultant to help with clean heat credits and so forth. And then section four is the three new positions in the PUC and three new positions in the Department of Public Service. So if we look more carefully now at table one, you can see that I've spelled out here the, uh, the uh, appropriations that are part of the bill you can see the three new FTEs. Um, the total for those comes to 330,000. The three third party consultants, and I'm assuming either six months or nine months for these consultants. And then we have the per diems for the advisory group members and the marketing and public outreach. These uh, figures actually came from the PUC. So uh, we have looked at them, we've talked to the PUC about this, and, and these are our best guesses about how much would actually be required for each of these items. Any questions about the PUC 600,000? Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's see. Then we have table two showing appropriations for the Department of Public Service. Here you can see that the three FTEs are a bit higher on the income scale. And so they're, they're uh, responsible for about 450,000 of the 600,000 with 150,000 going to verification, monitoring and evaluation. And again, all of that 1.2 million comes from the general fund. If there are no questions, uh, here's my very short paragraph talking about the impact on Vermont's economy. As I indicated earlier, it's just too soon for us to do an analysis of what the impact will be. Uh, what we really need to know is how the clean heat standard is going to be implemented, including how the clean heat, standards, uh, clean heat credits are priced and how the incentives or subsidies are offered to households and businesses. Uh, it's likely that there could be costs for the state, but we don't know how big those are. Uh, it's likely there will be larger fiscal impacts in future years, but again, it's just too soon to know what those would be. And at this point, I can tell the committee that we have been in conversation with various leaders in the House and Senate. Uh, as you may recall, the Global Warming Solutions Act requires the Joint Fiscal Office to produce a report for the legislature that looks at Actually, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you. There we go, that's better. Uh, re requires JFO to, to produce a report for the legislature that looks at the economic, budgetary and fiscal impacts of the uh, uh, climate, uh, the CAP, the, uh, what is it? Uh, the big report that was put out by the Vermont uh, Climate Council. And we are in the process of completing a short report that will be available, we hope by the end of April for the legislature. And we have plans to work on a, a much more detailed report over the summer that will look more specifically at the kinds of incentive programs that work, and in particular that work for low income and moderate income 
uh, households in a rural state in particular. Um, so that'll be really interesting. We'll be looking at uh, incentive programs that are available in other states, as well as the ones that are in existence in Vermont already to try to see what will work and how expensive those programs might be. Do you all have questions for me? Um, well, so thank you for laying that out. I know that uh, it's like looking at the uh, design for a program before it's gone out to bid. You know, so who knows what the, the operational cost will be. The question I have is we have, and this is really uh, outside of the fiscal note, but related to it. In the bill itself, uh, there is a section, uh, section three, public utility commission implementation that requires reports back from the PUC to the legislature in order to help it assess and track progress in the program and get them in, uh, in January, it's currently drafted January of 2023 and again in January 2024. Um, and then um, what I'm wondering is if some of the other, and I, well, let me read it as amended approximately. I haven't, we're redrafting the section, but it says the 2023 report shall include modeled impacts of the clean heat standard on customers, including impacts to customer rates and fuel bills for participating and non participating customers, fossil fuel reductions, and greenhouse gas reductions. The modeled impacts shall estimate high medium and low price and GHG reduction impacts. So um, what I'm wondering is without requesting additional information from <laughs> JFO, if there's information that we should be citing mm -hmm. as available to the legislature, the next legislature to assess the, um, that would be helpful to them in assessing the costs and benefits of the clean heat standard, which by next January will actually be very young, will only have just been started. But by the following January, enough work will have been done, I think, to have much more substantial data for analysis. And I'm just trying to um, provide the legislature with more and better information uh, as it considers, you know, do we keep on funding it, keep on operating it, keep on or amend the implementation plan, et cetera. Do you have any suggestions about what we can tie into what you're already doing that would be useful? Sure, so I'm happy to think about this more, but the first thing that comes to mind is that you are focusing at the moment on the households, the customers who have been using fossil fuels and, and either will be incentivized to switch or, or not switch. Um, but I think another important aspect for the state's economy is the fossil fuel providers, the distributors and so forth. So you might want to consider adding to your list um, the impact on those fossil fuel providers or um, heating fuel providers, I guess, more generally. Senator McDonald. What will you be doing a impact study on our on the economics of not doing anything? Yes, so so part of our study will look at the business as usual case, which means what if we stick with what's already in place and what's going to be in place already going forward. So this is the same approach that was used by the, uh, the Climate Council. They looked at business as usual, and then they looked at the, the combined impact of all of their actions. So yes, we will be looking at that. So if you've been asked to do a business as usual report two months ago, would it be different than the business as usual report that you would do today? So I'm going to change your question a little bit. Uh, we're going to be doing a business as usual report this summer. And that means that we will take into account uh, some of the measures that have been put into law this summer, uh, uh, before this summer, right, in this session. 
Um, so we will take out the clean heat standard from the summertime business as usual case and then compare without the, the clean heat standard and with the clean heat standard. I think that's the way we'll go. I guess my question was, when we're, as we try to get off using fossil fuels and you have a war in Ukraine and the price of fuels goes to a level that you had not imagined two years ago. Um, I'm trying to understand the economic, how we predict the economic impacts that we can't predict. Um, right, so generally speaking, the approach is to use a sensitivity analysis to say we are forecasting that the whatever diesel prices will be X going forward, but what happens if they're 10% higher or 10% lower? So that's known as sensitivity analysis and that's a common part of business as usual. How much of that we can do this summer with limited resources? I'm not sure, but we'll try for sure. And well, 10% seems like a higher or lower, seems like a percentage we would have used for the last few years, but certainly hasn't hit the last couple of months. Um, you're going to do an impact, second question, you're going to do an impact analysis on how this will affect fuel dealers. Um, some fuel dealers are going to adjust and go into other businesses, and some are going to quit um, and do something else. Um, where, do you plan to monetize that or tell us, what are you going to tell us that we don't already know about what's going to happen if we pass this bill when it comes to the future of fuel dealers? Sure. So I think you have really high hopes for the JFO report this summer. I don't think we can look at all of the what I consider microeconomic uh, events that could take place. We will certainly recognize the fact that that some uh, dealers may decide not to stay in business and what impact might that have? How many and, and what's the exact effect? I, I don't think we'll be able to, to look at very carefully. So we'll be looking at um, what I would consider the macro level effects, the sort of statewide effects rather than the individual business effects. Does that help? Well, it, my, my prediction is that you will write a report that says we really don't know what will happen, but count on a bunch of them quitting and others adapting and uh, we will keep you advised as it takes place. Uh, other than that, um, what do you plan to tell us. Right. So, um, so at the moment, we're thinking that where we can add some value is in looking at the kinds of incentives or subsidies that exist in other places, as well as in Vermont, to show if they are effective in getting households and businesses to change the way that they use heat in their residences and in their businesses. So I think this is one area where the, the Climate Council did not have the time or the resources to really dig in and, and look at those kinds of incentive or subsidy programs. So uh, yes, we are charged with looking at the overall economic effect, but we do have to think hard about what we can do at this stage and where we can be the most useful given our limited resources. So um, yes, we would love to do a more full-blown study and look at all these interesting aspects, but I'm, I'm afraid we, we can't promise too much at this stage. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Manchester, uh, can you send us, so the report you're currently writing that's going to take context for the work next session, um, can you send us language that tells us precisely what this called, where it's called for, et cetera, because I'd like to be able to cite it as people say, what resources will be available to the next legislature uh, in order to, to examine the question of continuing to work on clean heat standards. And that would be helpful. Sure, I can send that to Jude in just a minute, yep. Okay, great. Um, and then the other thing is, if you could take, uh, actually, we don't have a 
a next draft yet. So when I get the next draft of that report section, I was reading aloud, um, which, you know, uh, impacts to participating and non-participating households, et cetera. I would like to send that to you and have you give it a look over and see how you might um, uh, fine tune it for us to make it more helpful still. Absolutely, okay. happy to do that, sure. Okay, great. Thank you on both accounts. All right. Um, any committee questions for Ms. Manchester? No, but thank you. So we don't, uh, if you could hold off for a moment. Uh, so we don't usually pause and take questions from non-scheduled people in the room, but did you have a question for the, could you introduce yourself to the committee? And did you have a question for us or for our analyst in Ms. Manchester at the Joint Fiscal Office? Well, I'm new here. I, I'm a fuel dealer in Hardwick. Uh -huh. I've been in business 35 years. Okay. And, and, and your, your name, please? Alex Henson. Alex Henson. Okay. So my question, uh, just in gathering a few bits of information, uh, what would uh, this committee have to say about what, what's going to happen to the fuel dealers or what is going to be the impact against these fuel dealers with this passing of this bill? That's a simple question. Okay, so that's you know exactly what we're discussing now. So the bill becomes, by way of explanation, so other people may be watching and have the same question. The bill doesn't uh, become effective for January 1 of 2025. There's a long development period that's going to be happening through a public process mediated by the Public Utility Commission, which will include uh, uh, actually a very large number of public meetings as well as more formal hearings and any parties uh, that are interested will be invited to those meetings. Certainly, fuel dealers will be amongst them. So they'll be. The bill is uh, establishing a framework to address uh, how would we reduce the amount of emissions we're setting up in the air as we heat our homes. It doesn't prescribe the answer, and it says let's figure this out through this process that will be mediated by the PUC. So you would be invited into that process to provide testimony because one of the questions we'll be asking is exactly. The one we've been discussing for the last 10 minutes, what will the impact be on households? What will the impact be on fuel dealers? What will the impact be on other people who are, participate you know, in the way we heat homes? Yeah. Can I say a few more things? Uh, briefly. Okay. Well, um, as far as preventing emissions in the air, and my point is, uh, it's about the oil burners about the efficient boilers and furnaces and uh, paperwork is only going to make difficult, already difficult situation with uh, taking care of every, uh, every paperwork detail and just stay in business and manage to and help all these people. We all have different needs. If we can't get those efficient uh, insulation is also extremely important. Yeah. We already have most efficient oil burners and boilers available in person. It's just a matter of insulating the homes and uh, not imposing paperwork below our home. Well, so they, that, uh, I'd say a couple of things. One, the program is not prescriptive. So it can be that one of the things that's uh, discussed is moving to more efficient heating appliances, whatever type, whether they're or a heat pump or an oil boiler. Um, and there's also the use of, there will be the program is voluntary. So households could decide to stick with exactly what they're currently doing. They don't need to make a change. It's a voluntary program. And some folks might stick with the same equipment, but then you might be selling them a blend of fossil, you know, regular fossil fuel with uh, biofuels blended in. B80, B90, so uh, there, there are going to be many choices available and the economics of it, we need it to work for people, not being imposed on people, it's a, a way of helping change a system that really is not 
working well for Vermonters. The cost in terms of the amount of limits is When you say biofuel, you mean cooking oil, that is it discarded out of mixed with heating oil. And then there's both, there's the versions that derive new biofuels, deriving from like soy based crops, soy -based. as well as waste oil out of things like uh, fresh fryers. Right? Yeah. Okay. That means. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, with that, so thanks for those questions. Those are all good questions and live topics that are going to be subject of discussion from here for an uh, active discussion for years to come. And the program itself says here's our goal, the details of how we get there, uh, most cost effectively for everybody are to be worked out through the process that the bill lays out. Um, so Ms. Manchester, thank you for uh, staying with us. I, I just wanted to double check um, any kind of committee questions for Ms. Manchester before we move on. No, thank you. All right. So um, good to see you back at the Senate Department. I have good news. Well, good. Good. All right. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Uh So with that, we're going to return to our next scheduled witness. Um, good morning again, Ms. Smith. I'm glad you could come back. Uh, the floor is yours. We have approximately 20 minutes. I hope that's enough time for you to. Uh, Would you say that again, thoughts. please? I didn't hear how much more time you said. Two, two minutes. <laughs> that's what I, said, what I heard. No, I said 20. <laughs> 20. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Annette Smith. I thank the committee very much for hearing my testimony today. I am executive director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment. I have spent hours and hours and hours in the Climate Council meetings in the over the last more than a year. Uh, there were a handful of us who attended meetings. I attended steering committee, Climate Council, Ag and Ecosystem. Primarily, I can, uh, attended the uh, cross-sector mitigation subcommittee but I also weighed in on just transitions and science and data. So I have a very uh, good knowledge of how this bill came about and how the Climate Council has operated. Um, I will observe that the process was extremely rushed. Uh, nobody on the council had seen the full report 12 hours before it was presented to the meeting where it had to be voted on. Uh, the Climate Council- uh, Ms. Smith, are, are you saying that the final version of this Climate action plan was voted. Okay. It was presented. It, I kept refreshing it to make sure when it to, to, to read it, it got posted between eight and nine o'clock on a, the night before the meeting, between eight and nine the next day, where they voted on it. Um, and so they were counting on TCI to meet the emissions goals. That fell apart the week before. I can state there were tensions between subcommittees, especially ag and ecosystem and cross sector mitigation. And my general observation is that the Climate Council has no accountability process. And Senator Campion, I happened to just by the accident of YouTube, see a video of you asking questions two years ago about uh, shouldn't we have some accountability before the plans adopted? Shouldn't we vote on it? You were asking extremely good questions and you were told no. And, yeah, and it didn't happen. And I think the legislature needs to revisit the Global Warming Solutions Act, expand the narrow priority of emissions reduction, but any representation that the language in the Climate Action Plan is fully supported by all the Climate Council members, I don't think is accurate. So uh, those are my preliminary remarks. Uh, Jude, could you please make me able to screen share? Request for Can you send me your presentation as well. Screen share is what she's. I did. Yeah, no, I know. It was some, somebody else asked. <laughs> Senator McDonald. I'll send it to you when I'm finished, if that's all right. Yeah. So I put a question mark next to reducing emissions because I understand that that is the goal. And I do have questions about whether the clean heat standard will <laughs> result in emissions reductions. I have created this presentation to uh, do what I would call deconstructing the uh, clean heat standard. So I have four pages and then I have a page of questions and issues and suggestions for changes. I believe that I have pulled everything out of the bill, but I've categorized it 
so that we can look at it from various perspectives. So the elements of the clean heat standard that are options for consumers, and as you pointed out, uh, this is optional. Uh, my first question is, where is the consumer advocate? Who has testified either on the House side or in this committee, or who will testify on behalf of consumers? And I'll, I'll get to more of that later. So the options that uh, consumers have, well, first of all, if you want to participate and you are lower moderate income, you have to disclose your income to your fuel supplier, which I find to be rather an, uh, an off-putting uh, requirement, but it's on the fuel dealers to uh, figure out how many, the percentage of credits for low and moderate income customers. Uh, they can participate in the district heating system. Uh, that I assume is going to be wood burning. So I will expand on those issues later. They can hire a contractor to weatherize the building. Uh, that can get into big bucks. $10,000 is not unheard of. And uh, you run into all kinds of issues like asbestos and that remediation can be very expensive. And finding workers right now is, as I'm sure you all know, a challenge. Uh, they can purchase and install heat pumps and or efficient thermal appliances. Uh, so what does efficient thermal appliances mean? That means, in my perspective, from what I've been listening to, uh, electric hot water heaters. Now, I will note that I am speaking to you from the perspective of the public, since nobody else seems to be doing that, but also from as someone who has lived off-grid with renewable energy since 1989. And so I understand how renewable energy systems work. And I think in terms of systems, my current system has solar panels, batteries, and a backup right now gasoline generator, but I have had propane. I also have propane refrigerator, kitchen stove, and uh, backup uh, instant hot water heater. And I also have a very robust solar heating system. When I was recommending to the Climate Council that they could do something very easily to reduce emissions, which was to support uh, solar hot water, which really works and is uh, a much faster payback period, that got nowhere. And it took me a while to understand that the goal is to incent and create incentives or encouragement for electric hot water heaters so that the utilities can control your hot water heaters and turn them down during peak load periods. So this is all about the electrification of things. And so this also then goes to what is your fuel source? So I will ask each of you, what is your fuel source? And, and I'm not, these are sort of rhetorical questions, but think about it. Where does your electricity come from? So in Vermont, we have the regional grid and this builds on some of what Kim Hayden showed you, but in a slightly different way, or we can look at real time right now. Okay, real time right now, 52% natural gas, 22% nuclear. We had a lot of wind. So this shows the wind. Uh, this is about the maximum that you ever see. Very often you look at this as this is after dark um, and you'll see that the renewables part is 5%. Last summer, uh, the natural gas part was as much as 72%. Renewables was commonly five to 6%. So that's one answer about where does your electricity come from? So when somebody is running their air source heat pumps at night in the winter, where, what is the fuel? All right, so this is Green Mountain Power. This is all what is currently on their website. This is Vermont Electric Co-op. This is Washington Electric Co-op. And this is Burlington Electric. And this is VEPSA. So I'm providing you with this to give you some sense that the answer to where does your electricity come from is not a simple answer. And that because you have created a complicated system that allows for rec arbitrage, the uh, air source heat pumps at night are likely running on Hydro-Quebec, uh, but, but remember, if it's gonna be renewable energy, it won't be biomass, it won't be wind, and it won't be solar. At night, it won't be solar. All the wind and, and biomass wrecks are sold out of state. Are how much of it is grid mix? How much of it is natural gas? There's nothing in this bill that, that requires any of that analysis. But from my perspective, living with a renewable energy system, I would never install an air source heat pump because it runs at night 
and anything that runs at night is going to draw down my battery. And there's no amount of, of, well, I suppose if I was really wealthy, I could put in enough solar panels and enough batteries to make use of it. But in general, physicists will tell you using electricity for thermal uh, is, is just not really very smart. And we do have a good option in solar hot water, but that wasn't of interest to the Climate Council. Uh, I can say that pretty much nothing I said or any of the other members of the public who spoke during public comment made any difference at all. Um, okay, or I could purchase a, uh, and install a wood pellet stove. Now I heat with, with cord wood. I also have, a, have to have a propane heater in the basement because I couldn't get fire insurance without putting in backup uh, reliable heating. And I would never install a wood pellet stove because it requires a fan to run and the fan would run at night. And so that's not something that I think is viable. Um, and then the wood pellets, they, they're using fossil fuels for harvesting, for transport, for processing. And then you have all of that uh, plastic wrapping that you have to deal with. You all deal with waste. So I'm sure you understand the waste issues. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that a consumer can do is to switch fuel from oil to sustainably sourced biofuel. I heard Jared's testimony and with his amendments the other day, because I did a search on sustainably sourced and there is no such thing. However, we could look at uh, the report that Greenpeace has done. Oh, I got to find it. Um, and Greenpeace has done a report that is about, sorry, it's not showing up where I thought it was. the certification of fuels and the games that get played in the certification of things and a scorecard. So just be aware that everything that you are looking at doing regarding sustainably sourced fuels is a complicated structure of modeling and analysis and assumptions and uh, nothing that's straightforward. Or people can use renewable natural gas, uh, which is currently not in the greatest supply and uh, is uh, more expensive. Or people can switch from propane to what? I don't know. I, I don't. I have a question for you from Senator McDonald. Sure. So what you, you are stating that there are no simple answers to the questions you're asking. Um, you've, you've dismissed some proposed options um, and in dismissing them, you've been identified their shortcomings. Um, you've identified a lot of challenges and um, we are, we, you and this committee are looking at complicated issues that require analysis and need to be answered. And you are asking the same questions that we are asking. And we have concluded that the people on the Natural Resources Committee can't answer these questions. We're not, we don't have the, the talents and the experience and the time. And we seek to put the questions that you've asked to those who have more expertise and to I, make I understand. suggestions. And I understand that, and I will be addressing that a, a little further down. So we we would are eager to learn what you would recommend that we. I understand. Do. I'm I'm spending okay. the most time on this slide. Then I'm going to get to my solutions page or, or suggestions page. Can I keep going? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I I do want to point out I have no alternatives. I am living with a renewable energy system. I have done everything I possibly can. I've made investments. I've weatherized my house. I've, I've replaced the windows. I do not have alternatives for propane. There is nothing else. And the only thing I could do is take out my oil furnace and put in a biofuel furnace. Is that an answer? So I wanna make that really clear. My propane dealer is gonna go out of business if this happens and it's a small business. So the, the uh, options for fuel dealers, they're going to collect our income data. Are you kidding me? Um, 
Okay, so they can hire workers to weatherize the, and install heat pumps, install pellet stoves. They can purchase these sus mystery sustainably sourced biofuels and renewables. They can register as an obligated, or they have to register. These are not options. They have to register as an obligated party and they can assign credits or make alternative compliance payments to the default delivery agent. The PUC, so you are pointing to the PUC as the answer. I have spent the last decade working in the PUC process. I view this climate council, which has no accountability, as now creating all of these tentacles that are now gonna create a whole lot more public process supposedly, which is very difficult for the public to participate in. And so this is the page that's about uh, what's on paper. And then there's this page about what they have to do with people. They're gonna create two different committees. Okay, now I have to dog two more committees in, in addition to the climate council. When am I ever gonna find time to do all of this stuff? They're gonna hold public meetings. And, and it's, that it can be done, I don't think it should be done at this time. I think that you have created something here in this legislature that is overly complicated, unnecessarily complicated. I agree that there is groundwork to be laid, but doing it this way with this PUC under this time pressure, I think is, is unrealistic and is not going to involve in, in result in the type of public engagement that you are expecting. So I'm, I'm rushing here, but I will tell you now uh, some of the questions I have. Is there data to support the installation of heat pumps resulting in emissions reductions? Because I keep hearing about people who've installed them, they uh, went to the expense of it, and then they can't run them because they're too expensive. I've also heard about people who, uh, the, on the house side, the testimony from the fuel dealer was he has a lot of unhappy customers who've installed them and they're not warm enough. Uh, the advanced wood heat accounting. This is probably one of the most important things for your committee to do to move this bill forward is to recognize that the, uh, the emissions from wood burning are not treated as emitting carbon. And so here's the data that comes from the state uh, program and it is the most current data and uh, carbon dioxide, million metric tons, 0.503 million metric tons. This value is considered biogenic and is not currently accounted for in gross totals in the greenhouse gas inventory. Now, what does million metric tons amount to? 503 million, or 503,000 metric tons is equivalent to 108,000 uh, passenger cars or 595,000 acres of forest in one year. But Vermont doesn't consider those emissions at all in our accounting. And I think that's just plain out flat wrong that we're, we're not being honest about it. The idea that it's biogenic because the trees grow back in 50 or 100 years is absurd. Steve Crowley re referenced the IPCC report recently and it had as one of its solutions that we have to do in the next 10 years is plant more trees. So let's be honest about our emissions and let's count all of the CO2 emissions and not play games because that's what I'm seeing is a lot of what's in this bill is a lot of gimmicks. A lot of what's been happening with our emissions accounting is gimmicks. Let's be honest about uh, what is actually happening. We are counting methane and uh, nitrous oxide emissions from McNeil, but we're not counting and, and Rygate too and any other biomass burner. Um, Biofuels accounting, I couldn't find it accounted for in the most recent greenhouse gas inventory. You have had talks, you have discussions about winners and losers. Losers. Well, this could be a long list, but I can already uh, see based on what was stated in the House committee, where propane dealers came in and said, "You pass this, we're out day one." And so I'll be stuck with a big company. They charge a whole lot more. Their rates aren't regulated. Uh, and the, who will be the major beneficiary of biofuels? To, will it be the industrial agriculture? Is that what you really want to be supporting? Uh, headlines recently that the Midwest farmers are planting more soy. Yeah, they can see the writing on the wall. Uh, you know, between corn for ethanol and soy for biofuels, big business, that's what this supports. And will the increased use of biomass have an adverse effect on biodiversity? There are plenty of resources out there that talk about the potential for uh, and problems of biofuel, the uh, land use changes, the accounting errors. Uh, the you know, I will give you some of these resources and hope that you will look at them. So since I've got, let me see how many minutes left. Uh, two minutes left, a minute and a half. Uh, 
We need standards, suggestions for changes. Top of my list, create an office of consumer advocate. If you're gonna do a big bill like this that affects consumers this way, we don't have a consumer advocate. I don't know if you remember uh, back about six or seven years ago, AARP uh, did statewide ads and they called for a, a public advocate. They said, we are the ones in the room testifying for the consumers, we're not gonna do it anymore. Okay, so New Hampshire has one, Don Kreis, who used to work for the PUC, understands Vermont, he worked at Vermont Law School. Why don't you ask Don Kreis, or maybe this is something for the, the Finance Committee, but the Office of Consumer Advocate exists in Maine, it exists in Pennsylvania, it exists in Illinois. They do a great job of advocating for consumers. We don't have one. Our Department of, of Public Service is an advocate for ratepayers for electricity, but we don't have anything for fuel customers. This is a whole new world for public. I was out today with a few neighbors and asked each one of them, have you put in an air source heat pump? One of them had no idea what one was. Uh, the other two hadn't. I asked about weatherization. One of them said, well, uh, we were gonna do it until it turns out that we have to do $20,000 worth of asbestos remediation. I mean, this is, a, this is a big deal what you're planning to do here with this legislation. Remove propane from the bill, please. Unless you can find an alternative, please don't saddle our really wonderful small propane dealers with this uh, really, really awful uh, obligation. And I, you had some testimony that I'm not, I gathered it. I didn't really think you understood the you know, crude oil and propane and the process. So, the process of crude oil leads to all these different products and the propane is what comes off the top of it. So I just wanted to give you that so you, so you see what the propane uh, person was talking about. Uh, I think that the best thing that we can do to reduce emissions is focus on weatherization. You heard that from Rebecca Fosser of Efficiency Vermont. Weatherization, weatherization, weatherization. Take that $20 million that's proposed for cell towers and put it into weatherization. Take the drive test for cell, cell service, the 1.5 million, and use that for a drive test in February and look at where the icicles are on all the houses. Those are the ones that need to be weatherized. Drive just look around the quality of the houses in our state. This is a big deal and it's the biggest thing that you could do. And I don't think you have to do it through this complicated bill. But if you're gonna do this bill, add solar hot water as a way for a fuel dealer to earn credit. Establish a mechanism for to credit the heat, clean heat pumps for their in, for their usage, not just their installation. Require biomass accounting to include CO2 emissions, not carbon neutral. That's a must. Please do that. Please be honest about CO2 emissions. Require a cost analysis for implementation. Require renewable <laughs> electric fuel source identification. You hear about life cycle analysis for electricity sources. When you are running your air source heat pump, the, the Vermonter needs to know where is that electricity coming from? Is it coming from Hydro-Quebec, which is not carbon free? And as you heard from Judy Dow has all kinds of, of justice issues and flooding all those areas releases a lot of methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, is it coming from natural gas? Is it coming from Vermont or from Seabrook Nuclear? Be honest, tell the public where they're electricity is coming from when they are running their heat pumps at night in the winter. I recommend since you've had some testimony about uh, some sort of check back, if you're gonna pass this bill, which I think is a big mistake, you should require that it uh, come back as a rule rather than an order. And then it can go through ICAR and LCAR of which some of you are on. And there's a, a real legislative check back that day, that way. And my final uh, comment here on these rec suggestions is please be realistic. Uh, that liquid fuel sources are undergoing major and renewable energy resources, major geopolitical and supply chain challenges uh, with existing efficiency Vermont weatherization and heat pump programs and utility programs and the rest tier three. Is this complicated and potentially unenforceable legislation necessary at this time? I mean, you've been you've been told that you're going to get a lawsuit over the Global Warming Solutions Act. I can easily see there being a lawsuit over from the fuel dealers over this. And finally, hey. use less. The okay. uh, 
the real energy transition will almost certainly not, not be a complete and seamless migration from fossil fuels to solar and wind, but rather a shift from using a lot of energy to using a lot of less, a lot less. And that is where the, the Climate Council really did not come through for us as Vermonters. So thank you, and I'd be glad to take it. Uh, then we could have a long discussion based on it. We look forward to being able to read it offline. Uh, we have another witness, and his time is running out. So I oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see anybody else on the schedule, so I apologize. <laughs> um, so the uh, Mr. Walsh, if you would just join us in the chair, you will clean up. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank, thank you. you. I look, thanks for sending it in electronically. I look forward to spending time with the information you gathered together. I will do that. Okay, Mr. Walsh, you have roughly four minutes. <laughs> I've done it in two, so hopefully okay. that'll work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, for the record, Ben Edgerly Walsh with Deep Purge. I wanted to provide the committee just some brief thoughts on this bill and, and really sort of frame up how we're thinking about it. And I know this thinking is very similar to the thinking of a number of other major environmental organizations in the state. So while I'm speaking for Beeberg, it's certainly reflective of others thinking as well. I'm going to start by very briefly saying we support this bill passing and we support the proposed revisions and Mr. Duval brought in on Wednesday. We think they, they strengthened in modest but in important ways. And then I just wanted to share how we are thinking about this bill. There are three principles that have been front and center about how we are uh, thinking about this, how we're thinking about improvements to it, three lenses as you were, since I reviewed the white paper that sort of originated this concept many months ago. Number one is this program actually requiring fossil fuel companies to do the work to hit our carbon reduction requirements in the thermal sector. Number two, is it doing that in a life cycle way so that we are not simply making our carbon pollution some other areas problem, but actually reducing global carbon emissions because of this policy? Number three, is it doing that in an equitable way that actually allows low income and moderate income Vermonters to be a part of this transition to cleaner and in many cases more affordable and more price stable fuels and on each instance each of those pillars for us the answer is yes there are ways that this bill has moved in the direction of those throughout the process we've been supportive of those moves and the bill as a whole checks each of those boxes at this point that's not to say it's perfect that's not to say you couldn't write a more perfect bill given more time but it does do each of those things Happy to, if you have questions about how or sort of where in the bill it does those things, I'm happy to get into that. But it hits these targets. It does so in a life cycle way with a robust analysis to back that up. And it does so equitably delivering these measures to low and moderate income Vermonters. I also just wanted to very briefly say another very important piece of context is this bill is not happening in isolation. There's roughly $150 million that is currently in the budget between 80 million for weatherization, 20 million for electrification, and 50 million roughly for municipal efficiency and fuel switching in H518 that will very much fold for the effort that this bill is putting forward and are a really important part of the package of climate actions in the thermal sector that the legislature is contemplating this year. Uh, so the last thing I will say, since I have 90 seconds more, is what has been happening in Ukraine and to the oil markets because of that horrible, horrible tragedy to us has really heightened the need for this action. The only way to get Vermonters off of the hamster wheel of seeing their fuel bills spike every two years, every four years, every 10 years, periodically without fail, is to help Vermonters move in a concerted, deliberate way away from price falls of fossil fuels. This policy is the first holistic policy that has gotten close to the finish line in this legislature in my 12 years at Deeper, 
that would actually set forward a strategy and a path to do that. And that is a big part of why we feel it is so important. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Chair McCormick, and then we're off the table. Okay. In terms of reducing uh, reliance on fossil fuels, adequate to meet our our schedule? The Global Warming Solutions Act requirement of 40% reduction by 2030 would be legally required to be met by the actions obligated parties to be taking, taken under this bill. That is a well, I know that, order. but is, does, does this program do that? Yeah, no, I'm saying the Clean Heat Standard as written requires fossil fuel fossil fuel companies total actions to add up to okay, okay. that number in 2030 and the 80% number in 2050. That is a central tenant of this bill. Well, thank you very thank much you. to everyone. Uh, busy morning, but I'm glad we got to hear from everyone. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. And thank you for taking the time. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for not being here. That's okay. We know you had to be very important to take care of your health.